I'm Dr. Jill Vecchio, and I'm a radiologist and breast imager. Women's imaging is my subspecialty, and I've read the healthcare law. So another way that this law is going to decrease healthcare costs or limit them, control them, is by decreasing reimbursement to physicians and hospitals or providers in general. And that also includes like your physical therapists, um, nurses, home health, things like that. So there are a lot of people that are going to be affected by this. Number one is accountable care organizations, and we'll actually cover that in a later segment when we talk about how it affects doctors directly. Uh, the other one is the Independent Payment Advisory Board. So right now, you've heard about the doctor fix or the sustainable growth rate, and we'll talk about that in more depth later. Um, and that's controlled by Congress. So Congress is supposed to decide uh, what the reimbursement will be to physicians. According to Kathleen Sebelius, if the Congress can't get the job done, they've instituted the Independent Payment Advisory Board, IPAB. This should scare everybody. This is a 15-member panel appointed by the President, does have to be approved by the Senate. It has the power to make law. In other words, a panel of non-elected officials has the power to make decisions that will actually become law. Not just rules or regulations, but actual law. Without legislative, uh, with, without going through the usual legislative process. So we talked about comparative effectiveness. It sets the price on a val it sets a price on the value of every year of your life. And if any treatment or diagnostic test exceeds that value, then you don't get it. Some of the ways that this law will bring in money is through a Cadillac tax on high premium policies. Um, I'm just going to kind of go through, you'll see a couple of these things. We're not going to go into these in depth because it's a lot of kind of minutia, but they are important and things that people are talking about. Uh, annual fees on drug manufacturers, medical device manufacturers, and insurance companies. Remember earlier from, from this talk in Section A, we talked about um, how all the costs to pharmaceutical companies, medical devices, and businesses get passed on to the consumer. So that's just going to increase our costs. Um, it eliminates a tax deduction for Part D coverage, and there was a big hoopla about that earlier when it first passed with Caterpillar and AT&T. Um, it increases the hospital insurance tax rate by 0.9% for all the millionaires and billionaires, uh, making $250,000 adjusted gross income, and they have all these different calculations for how that works. Um, and also the Reconciliation Act added 3.8% net investment income or un unearned income tax that's part of the Medicare taxable base from for people that are earning, this is for a single person, $200,000 a year, or married filing jointly, $250,000 a year. And again, they have all these calculations. So if you sold your house and it puts you over the adjusted gross income um, upper margin, then uh, you would have to pay 3.8% on whatever amount it was over that. But like I said, there are a lot of complicated uh, little computations to that, so I'm not going to go into that. Now there's the Cal Class Act, which I say hardly because it's hardly a classy act. Um, the Class Act was meant to institute long-term health care uh, for everyone. Well, that sounds great, doesn't it? Let's look at the details. So this was going to be through the federal government. So starting um, in 2013, uh, people would, uh, through their employer, it would be an employee uh, a deduction for payroll deduction plan. So the uh, employer would um, participate in this program. If an employee did not want to participate, they had to opt out of it. If they didn't specifically opt out of it, uh, there would automatically be a payroll deduction from their paycheck to pay for this. Now, uh, initially, uh, the idea was that if you ever, you'd have to pay in for five years before you could ever make a claim for long-term health care based on this plan. And even if you paid in for five years and you wanted to collect, it pays out about 50 to $75 a day for long-term health care. You can't stay at a Motel 6 for that, let alone get long-term health care. Most long-term health care plans, the private policies, pay hundreds of dollars a day in long-term health care. So we're not getting very much for our money here. Now the CBO also then said, well, we're estimating that the premium costs for this are going to be about $300 or more per month per employee. Really, for $50 to $75 a day, and I'm paying in for five years. Now, 
Part of why this is included in the Health Care Act is because they need to have money generated. They need to generate revenue in order to offset the costs of this plan. So this class act uh, was going to help pay for the cost of, of PPACA or Obamacare um, for the first 10 years. So when, they, when the Congressional Budget Office did their estimates for the costs of, of uh, PPACA, they had five years of payments into the Class Act to offset the real costs. So it was really kind of fudging the numbers a little bit. Now, uh, there was a, a clause put into the law that said if this, can't, if this isn't financially viable over a 75 year period, you can't enact it. So right now, Secretary Sebelius is in a sticky wicket. She has to decide. I know that this, she knows that this isn't financially viable. She said it herself. So technically, she's not supposed to do anything to enact this, but it's still in the law. So now, and then President Obama has said that he will veto any, um, any legislation that will repeal this. So we're kind of stuck here. It'll be interesting to see what happens with this. So now we are at the doctor fix, the sustainable growth rate. This was started in 1997 by Congress in order to control the cost of Medicare. So they proposed a decrease of something like 2.3% reimbursement to providers of Medicare services every year um, in order to control the cost of Medicare. Well, every year that it came up, Everybody had a big fit, and the doctors had a fit, and the hospitals had a fit. So Congress decided, eh, we're just going to wait. But that money is still on the books from an accounting standpoint, from a government accounting standpoint. So those numbers have added up. Now it's up to 27%. This is where the term kicking the can down the road comes from. So now it's at 27%. Now we have the super committee who didn't get their job done of decreasing costs. So now they're going to use a sustainable growth rate, which is now at about $300 billion. You'll hear all kinds of numbers. Um, but about $300 billion that it will cost that's already in the books for the government um, in order to get rid of this. Well, or, or they can enact that 27% decrease in provider reimbursement in order to help pay for the necessary budget uh, decreases that they need through the super committee. So 27% decrease when we've already talked about in the first segment the problems with Medicare and Medicaid is they don't cover our costs as providers in many cases. So you're going to decrease that by almost a third. Now you're talking about a real health care crisis. You're talking about Medicaid and Medicare patients that are not going to be able to find a provider. You're going to talk about doctors leaving the workforce in droves because all of our reimbursement is also based on factors of Medicare. So when we, when we uh, uh, contract with a third party payer like Anthem Blue Cross Blue Shield, we say we want 1.4 of Medicare because they know that our costs aren't covered by Medicare, so they're gonna give us a little bit more. So that's gonna go down as well. That's gonna create a real crisis. So let's see, how much will this law really cost us? So the CBO originally estimated $1 trillion. Now they've increased it already to $1.4 trillion. Now we know that the Class Act isn't going to be feasible, so they can't enact that, so that's hundreds of billions of dollars in addition to that that's going to cost us. And there are other revenue provisions that aren't going to be enacted that are going to cost additional billions of dollars. Um, we're going to have increased insurance premiums. We saw that. So we already talked about Medicare is going to be cut $575 billion, the sustainable growth rate, the doctor fix $300 billion. In this law, 159 new bureaucratic entities, grant programs, committees, panels, task forces are created, 159 new ones, and there is no scoring for them in this law. That's going to cost billions of dollars that's not counted yet. Cost to the states, the states are going to have to pay billions of dollars through their health care exchanges and increased enrollment in Medicaid and Medicare that will be offset with federal subsidy, i.e. taxpayer dollars, but only for a couple of years and the states are on their own. We're going to lose physicians and providers and it's going to give us new taxes and penalties. Let's see how well the government estimated the costs of Medicare. So when Medicare passed in 1965, they estimated that by 1990 they would be paying $9 billion a year in Medicare payments. The actual costs in 1990 were $67 billion. So the government doesn't do so well at estimating costs. So we can see that it's going to cost us as taxpayers 
as patients, as Americans, a lot. And that's not all. You'll find out the biggest cost to us in the next to last segment where we talk about the constitutional issues of this law. So this is our basic oh, accounting part of it. Uh, and it's in two segments. The next segment, we're going to talk about health care exchanges, the state health care exchanges, how they really work, and what this is going to mean to employers. So I'm Dr. Jill Vecchio, and thanks for watching.